In this video, I'm going to talk about breaking up differential forms into their components. This video is mostly going to be an upgraded version of my Tensors for Beginners videos on covector components and covector transformation rules, so I would highly recommend you watch those videos first before watching this one. The links to those videos are in the description. So in the last video, we talked about how the D operator takes a scalar field and produces a covector field by tracing out the level set curves of constant value and orienting the curves toward the positive scalar direction. We also saw that covector fields, which are also called differential forms, obey these linearity laws where we can add and scale the inputs or add and scale the outputs and get the same answer. We also saw how to compute the result of a covector field acting on a vector at a point by taking the covector at that point and counting how many covector lines that the vector pierces. And finally, we talked about how the geometrical interpretation of df of v is the directional derivative of the function f moving through a point with velocity vector v. In this video, I want to show that, just as we can write vectors as linear combinations of special basis vectors scaled by some components, we can also write differential forms as linear combinations of special basis differential forms, which are also scaled by some components. And we'll figure out what these A and B components are in this video. So to start off our investigation of breaking covector fields up into their components, let's begin by looking at how a bunch of different covector fields act on these two basis vectors which are the partial derivatives with respect to x and y. So let's take this scalar field f and look at its corresponding covector field df. Now what happens when df acts on the ex basis vector? Well that's the same thing as having it act on the partial derivative with respect to x. And remember, as we said in the last video, this is basically just the directional derivative of f in the x direction. And the directional derivative of f in the x direction is the same thing as partial f by partial x. And the same thing goes for df acting on the vector ey. This is just the directional derivative of f in the y direction, which is partial f by partial y. Now let's take a look at the scalar field x. In this scalar field, the scalar value at a point is just the value of x at that point. So the positives are on the right and the negatives are on the left. And here's the corresponding covector field dx. So dx of the ex basis vector is equal to the rate of change of x in the x direction, which of course is equal to 1. And this matches up with this picture here since the ex basis vector pierces one line. And dx of the ey basis vector is equal to the rate of change of x in the y direction, which is 0. And this matches up with this picture here where the ey basis vector pierces 0 lines. And again, we can do this same process for the scalar field y and its corresponding covector field dy. dy of the ex vector is just partial y by partial x, which is 0, which makes sense because there are 0 lines pierced by this ex basis vector in this picture. And dy of the ey basis vector is just partial y by partial y, which is 1. And again, that makes sense because there is one line that is pierced by the ey basis vector in this picture. Okay, so to sum up what we just covered, we have these relationships here, where the covector fields df acting on the basis vectors give us these partial derivatives here, and when the dx and dy covector field act on these basis vectors, we get either 1 or 0. We get 1 when the top and bottom variables are the same, and we get 0 when they are different. Okay, so why did we bother going through all this? Why do we care? What does this have to do with breaking up covector fields into their components? Well, if you'll recall, when I originally introduced covectors in my Tensors for Beginners series, I told you about these two special covectors, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, which we defined to obey these special relationships here. Basically, if the covector index matches the basis vector index, we get 1, and if the indexes are different, then we get 0. So these four relationships can be summarized by this one relationship here, Epsilon i of ej gives us the Kronecker delta ij. So if you think about it, the relationships we discovered in the previous slide are actually very similar, right? These partial derivative operators are just like these basis vectors, and these differential forms are just like these epsilon covectors. And if we replace the x variable with c1 and the y variable with c2, we can summarize these relationships like this where dci of the partial derivative with respect to cj gives us the Kronecker delta ij. And if you'll recall, these epsilon covectors actually ended up being the dual basis for the space of all covectors. So any arbitrary covector alpha can be written out as a linear combination of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, 
And the components alpha 1 and alpha 2 are just the amount of lines each basis vector pierces. So the first basis vector pierces two lines and the second basis vector pierces one line. So the components of the covector alpha would be 2, 1. So it turns out that just as epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 end up being a basis for the set of all covectors, it turns out that dx and dy end up being a basis for the set of all differential forms. So if we pick these coefficients properly, we can build this covector field df as a linear combination of the covector fields dx and dy. Now you might ask, how do we get these a and b coefficients? Well, it turns out we can determine what they are in just a couple lines. To get the coefficients, let's take some function f, and let's also take a curve parameterized by lambda, where the tangent vectors along the curve are given by d by d lambda. And let's consider the rate of change of this function as we travel along the curve, which is given by the derivative df by d lambda. Now recall that the covector f acting on the vector d by d lambda is equal to the derivative df by d lambda. So whenever we see derivatives like this, we can always replace it with a covector field acting on a vector. So if we choose to expand this derivative out in Cartesian coordinates using the chain rule, we can notice that these three terms each have derivatives with respect to lambda. So we can rewrite each of these derivatives as a covector field acting on the vector d by d lambda. And since covector fields, just like covectors, can be added and scaled together, we can rewrite this sum of covector fields like this, with this being a linear combination of covector fields acting on this vector. Now since both the left and right sides of this equation involve a covector field acting on the vector d by d lambda, we can deduce that this and this are actually the same covector field. They are just different ways of writing the same function. So this means that the covector field df can be written as a linear combination of dx and dy, using these partial derivatives as the scaling coefficients. So we've shown that any covector field df can be written as a linear combination of dx and dy. And that means that dx and dy form a basis for the set of all covector fields. dx and dy are the dual basis of the vector basis for the x and y partial derivatives. So just as the x and y partial derivatives are the calculus versions of basis vectors, the differentials, or also called covector fields, dx and dy are the calculus versions of basis covectors. So this formula here probably seems a little bit abstract. Let's go through a concrete example so we can understand things a bit better. So let's take the scalar field f here. In Cartesian coordinates, the point x, y is assigned the scalar value y squared plus x minus 1 half. The covector field df associated with this scalar field is here. And we'd like to expand this covector field as a linear combination of the covector fields dx and dy. The correct scaling coefficients for dx and dy are given here by these partial derivatives. So let's calculate them. We find that partial f by partial x is equal to 1, and partial f by partial y is equal to 2y. And so this tells us that df is equal to 1dx plus 2y dy. So do these coefficients make sense? Well, let's look at this covector field df. Note that no matter where we are in this field, the horizontal spacing between the curves is always equal. And this makes sense because the dx component of this field is constant everywhere. So that means that the spacing between the curves in the x direction is also going to be constant everywhere. Also note that the curves in the df covector field are generally oriented toward the right. And this makes sense because the curves in the dx covector field are also generally oriented toward the right. Now let's look at the vertical spacing. Notice that the vertical spacing is larger toward the center, but the curves get closer and closer together as we move up or down. This matches up with the dy component getting bigger as y grows in size, because remember, a larger covector means a covector where the stacks are more dense. So when the value of y increases, we end up with a denser, bigger covector in the y direction. Also note how the curves in the top half of the df covector field are oriented upward, but the curves in the bottom half are oriented downward. This makes sense because when y is positive, we'll get positive versions of the upward facing dy covector. But when y is negative, we reverse the direction of dy and get curves that point downward. 
Now again, there's nothing special about the Cartesian coordinate system. We can also do the same thing in polar coordinates. So recall these formulas for changing between Cartesian and polar coordinates. We just sub this in for x and sub this in for y, and we get this function here for the scalar field f. So again, this scalar field f has a corresponding covector field df, and we'd like to expand it as a linear combination of the dr and d theta covector fields. To get the correct coefficients, we need to compute these partial derivatives. So partial f by partial r gives us 2r sine theta squared plus cosine theta. And partial f by partial theta gives us 2r squared sine theta cosine theta minus r sine theta. Now these coefficients are quite a bit more complicated than the Cartesian ones, but we can still check that they make sense. If we look at the locations where theta equals zero, which is basically this line here where the angle of rotation is zero, these coefficients end up being one, zero. These coefficients end up being one for the dr component and zero for the d theta component. And this makes sense since the covector here is equally spaced and pointing to the right, just like dr is equally spaced and pointing to the right. If we look at the points where theta is equal to pi over two, which is this line here where the angle of rotation is pi over two or 90 degrees, the coefficients end up being two r for the dr component and negative r for the d theta component. So along this line of 90 degree rotation, the dr covector field points in the upward direction and the d theta covector field points in the left direction. So since the dr component is positive, we would expect the curves in df to point in the same direction as the curves in dr, which is upward, which is exactly what we see. And since the d theta component is negative, we would expect to see the curves in df point in the opposite direction of d theta, which would be toward the right. And that's exactly what we see here. So while these polar coordinate components might look pretty complicated, it isn't too hard to believe that they're an accurate description of this covector field. So just as we can expand individual covectors into linear combinations of dual basis vectors, and of course we get different components depending on which basis we use, we can also expand differential forms, also called covector fields, into linear combinations of other covector fields where we get different components depending on which basis we use. And we can also write these formulas out more compactly using the Einstein notation like this. So the situations of individual covectors and covector fields are very similar. In both cases, we have a covector that we want to expand. We have the dual basis covectors, and we have the components that tell us how much of each basis covector is present inside the covector we want to expand. And these formulas here are the exact formulas we saw before when we talked about changes of variables in integration. We saw that a small step differential df could be broken up into a small step dx multiplied by this slope plus a small step dy multiplied by this slope. And these formulas here that we discovered in this video look the exact same as the differential formulas that we've known from multivariable calculus all along. It's just that we're reinterpreting them. Before, we thought of these differentials as small changes in a variable, but now we're thinking of them as covector fields, and this formula tells us how to break up one covector field into a linear combination of basis covector fields. So the main takeaway of this video is that we can expand covector fields into linear combinations of basis covector fields, and when we use different covector field bases, we get different covector field components. And really, this is just the same thing we've been doing all along with individual covectors, where we take a covector, expand it out into a basis, and then get components, depending on which basis we use. In the next video, we're going to learn the transformation rules for covector fields, and we're going to learn that basis covector fields are contravariant, but covector field components are covariant.